Hey, Forty-Two here. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Humans are a resilient bunch. We've lived through an ice age, defeated the violent and unforgiving wilderness, and sent man into outer space. But in the end, we could be defeated by a creature that we can't even see. Bacteria. We all worry about threats such as nuclear war, terrorism, and worst of all, a growing army of militant snowflakes. But could it be a global pandemic that wipes out humanity for good? The World Health Organization has added Disease X to its list of concerns that pose a serious threat to all of humanity. Disease X? What? I've never heard of that. That's because it doesn't exist. Yet. Disease X is the WHO's catch-all name for the next big disease epidemic, the next plague. We don't know where it will come from or in what format, but there's an almost 100% chance that it will come at some point. Homo sapiens have already faced some truly horrific genocidal viruses throughout our history. First came the Black Death that killed as much as 60% of Europe's population, then smallpox and the Spanish flu. But has our deadliest foe yet to rear its morbid head? Possibly. What would a humanity-destroying disease X need to look like to be effective? Which symptoms would it need to kill every person alive? The answer is none at all. The perfect disease would need to have no visible symptoms to ensure maximum virality. Humans avoid people who appear visibly sick. Subtle symptoms such as inflamed red nose and sinuses, or coughing and sneezing, are a clear sign to any passers-by to clear off. Any obvious symptoms would encourage people to keep their distance from the infected, and so the virus would have a harder job spreading. A disease that had no symptoms would have an immediate upper hand over humanity from the get-go. If the common cold were symptomless, a considerably higher number of people would catch it each year, but then if it was symptomless, it wouldn't really matter. But what if that symptomless virus fested in your system for two weeks before reaching a critical mass of infection level where your body has no choice but to give up and shut down? That would be the ultimate mass murdering virus. Because any disease which poses a hope of wiping out humanity would need a very long incubation period. This is the time it takes a virus to multiply in your system from the moment of initial infection to a point where it has enough of a command over your body that it can start to take effect. If the incubation period of this mystery virus was between one to three days, it would be almost impossible for it to wipe out the human race. It wouldn't make it very far at all. As soon as the first victim dies, then the international organisations, such as the CDC, would quickly step in to quarantine that area. As happened with the 2014 West Africa Ebola outbreak. In such scenarios, the CDC creates a perimeter around the patient zero, and that perimeter is dependent on the virus's incubation period, or time to kill. And today, the perimeter required to contain certain viruses can be accurately modelled using computer algorithms once some key details are known about the virus. The longer the incubation period, the further it can spread throughout a country unnoticed. With an incubation period of only a few days, it could be contained with relative ease by putting travel bans on everyone inside the perimeter. But if the incubation period was much longer, then the difficulty of containing the spread is exponentially higher. Within two weeks or more, a virus can jump from patient zero to halfway around the world and back before the CDC is even aware that anyone is infected. And by that point, it may be too late. There will now be multiple points of origin in various countries, and it suddenly becomes a game of whack-a-mole with a target that can multiply and spread to thousands of people in just hours. Yet nobody will know who those victims are and to where it has spread until two weeks later. Lastly, of course, disease X would need to be incredibly infectious. Viruses can spread through the air, water, touch, the more tools Disease X has to spread at its disposal, the deadlier it would be. But what if some maligned entity, a rogue state or terrorist organisation could actually design such a disease from the ground up? Unfortunately, they could, using current technology. 
CRISPR is a section of DNA that genetic scientists can edit. And when combined with a protein called Cas9, the new and edited DNA can be replaced in living cells to modify any behavior or physical features of that individual. CRISPR-Cas9 editing can be used on any living organism, from bacteria to cats to humans. CRISPR is a new and exciting technology that could allow us to effectively alter humanity forever. Scientists have already used similar techniques to edit aquarium fish so they glow in the dark. You can go right ahead and buy them in pet shops for fairly cheap. But if extremists mastered CRISPR, there's no reason why they couldn't use it to edit the RNA or DNA of a deadly virus to tweak it to their own evil desires. They could, for example, take Ebola and remove all visible symptoms, increase its average incubation period from 10 days to 30, and it could be adjusted to significantly ramp up its infectiousness and killing power. Essentially, this third party, whether it be a terrorist cell or enemy state, during a world war could design and create the so-called perfect virus. With all the attributes that I mentioned earlier, this would be the world's first synthetic bioweapon that would easily affect and kill many millions. And if you're thinking, surely a few religious nutjobs in the desert can't edit DNA, you'd be wrong. CRISPR-Cas9 editing is a relatively simple procedure. It's so quick and so cheap that you can buy a DIY kit to do it at home for just over £100. Yet, despite all this, the World Health Organization still doesn't believe that a synthetic, man-made disease poses the greatest threat to human health. The WHO has stated that the greatest biological threat is highly likely to come from the natural world. Mother Nature messes about with CRISPR billions of times every day. Bacteria constantly mutate every single day. Roughly 5 million trillion trillion bacteria on planet Earth undergo the process of natural selection. For instance, when two different strains of the flu virus meet, they cross over and give each other new genes and thus attributes and abilities. This is how new flu strains are created. Creating deadly viruses is a numbers game and Mother Nature plays the numbers trillions of times per day, leaving man-made virus creators in the dust. The maths is against us as a species. It may come tomorrow, or it may come in 10,000 years, but the next super virus that will make Ebola and the Black Death seem tame is going to come. And us humans are hardly helping matters. Why? Because our antibiotics are about to fail. One out of every three antibiotics prescribed is unnecessary. This is leading to a global epidemic, which the WHO says is one of the greatest threats to global health, food security, and development. When antibiotics are incorrectly or unnecessarily prescribed, they will fail to kill the intended bacteria in the patient. And over a typical two-week course, that surviving bacteria will learn how to defend against that antibiotic a little bit better. Bacteria does this anyway, even when antibiotics are correctly prescribed. But in such scenarios, it doesn't matter, because in those instances, the bacteria will be eradicated by the antibiotics, and thus it will never get the opportunity to pass on this new knowledge to the global bacteria biome. Essentially, this means that bacteria all over the world are slowly but surely becoming more resistant to every antibiotic. One day, bacteria may build up so much resistance that it becomes immune to antibiotics, and that would be utterly terrifying. If this happens, we would have no way of treating infections such as salmonella, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and gonorrhea. Without antibiotics, medicine would be dragged back to the Middle Ages and a simple finger cut could be enough to kill you. Obviously, antibiotics can't kill viruses anyway. We can only vaccinate against viruses and, thankfully, vaccines remain just as effective as always. So, how would antibiotic resistance help a super virus to wipe out humanity? Well, any lethal virus comes with horrific side effects such as lesions, sores, sickness and diarrhea. These are all an open doorway to infections. Because of this, people being treated for a powerful virus are usually prescribed antibiotics along with their antiviral medicine to keep infections at bay. 
These antibiotics are an essential tool to lower virus mortality rates, because without them, even if the virus didn't kill the patient, a subsequent infection may just finish them off. Oh, and if antibiotic resistance doesn't open the doors to a new super virus, then don't worry because the growing number of shit for brains anti-vaxxers are doing a fabulous job of prepping the human race for the next pandemic. All this sounds very alarmist, but let's be frank, could there be a new disease that actually succeeds in wiping out all of humanity? No. At least the chances are remarkably low. Mother Nature has had a go many times throughout recorded history, and it has never come close to creating a virus with the potential for mass extinction. Not to mention the thousands of global pandemics during the 200,000 years of unrecorded prehistory that human beings have walked the earth. There may very well have been a killer deadlier than the Black Death at some point during the enormous timeline of the human race, and we just don't know about it. The human race is amazingly resilient. Also, there is one more trait that would need to be almost mandatory for a killer virus to be effective, which I didn't mention earlier. To wipe out humanity, it would need to be unfamiliar. There are very few viruses in existence that have the potential to be mass killers, namely Ebola, HIV and influenza in the wild, and then the smallpox, hantavirus and Marburg, which are mostly confined to laboratories. A new supervirus would most likely be a new strain of one of those, and it may have infection and killing powers far superior to the previous strain, but that's not too concerning. Here's why. Microbiologists have been studying these viruses for decades. We have created complex computer models that predict exactly how they will spread. Government agencies have created detailed plans on how to contain any future outbreaks. And the medical field is constantly working on improved vaccines that will target each of these threats. And since any new strain of, say, influenza would have mutated from a previous strain, it will share most of the same properties. So, our existing plans and medical research could be applied to it. Yes, it may sadly kill a few hundred, a few thousand, or potentially a few million people, but those deaths would mostly hit undeveloped nations with poorer sanitation, and I'm not for a second trying to say that that's any less tragic. I'm simply pointing out that once it does hit a developed nation, it will have an extremely difficult time spreading. Just like we saw when Ebola arrived in the US. That is why the biggest threat that humanity could face would be a brand new type of virus. Not a new strain of an existing virus, but something science has never come across before. That's why the WHO is more concerned with what Mother Nature may produce than biohackers in their garage. Because biohackers will need to take an existing virus to modify it whereas Mother Nature has the power to create completely fresh and original super viruses, and we have no idea when and where it could happen next. If Disease X does come one day, and it does turn out to be the mass murderer we all feared, then humanity will probably still survive. Even when 99.9% .9 of the human race has been eradicated, there will always be tiny communities in the midst of the jungle, in the frozen Antarctic wilderness, and on boats in the middle of the ocean that would weather out the apocalypse and just about survive the pandemic. And just as gene therapy can be used to create new viruses, it can also be used to modify our existing genetic code to defend against them. Thanks to rapid advances in CRISPR-Cas9 research and protein design, the day could soon come when human beings could be granted immunity to all viruses. So I'm sorry viruses, but the human race is here to stay. Probably. And since the human race is going to be here for a little while longer, you can get on with promoting your brand and building a stylish online presence. And there's only one place you should go to build a website for your business, Squarespace. Squarespace provides an effortlessly simple set of online tools to craft your perfect website in the way you desire. I had a go at building a website for 42, and I was blown away by how quick and easy it was. The results look modern, stylish, and importantly, unique to my needs and my vision. There are integrated blogging tools to share stories, photos, videos, and updates, which is ideal for regular content creators such as myself. 
If you have an audience you want to stay in touch with, then Squarespace makes it a breeze. You can add social sharing buttons to your site with a few clicks. You can run email campaigns to stay in touch with your customer or contact list, like I've done. You can also take bookings and schedule through your Squarespace site. And clients can easily see your availability and reschedule if needed, taking the hassle out of coordinating calendars. Head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash 40 to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for a new video every week. And thanks again to the sponsor Squarespace. Don't forget to check them out by using the link in the description.